Should you Airbnb out your investment property to make huge bucks or should you stick to a traditional long-term rental? In this episode, we'll be going through the pros or pro of Airbnb and the cons of Airbnb because on the face of it, it seems like, hey, like, why wouldn't you do it? There's so much money to be had when you go on Airbnb.com and it's like, Jesus, this is expensive. You know, why can't I be on the other side? And even if I just have one or two investment properties, I Airbnb out, passive income, retire, exit my nine to five. What's stopping me doing that? I'll go through the pros and cons and at the end give you my synopsis, my takeaway of whether I will do it and whether you should do it. Welcome to the Oz Property Investment Mastery Podcast. My name is PK and I help busy people build passive income by buying top 5% growth and cash flow property and build a portfolio using data without wasting months doing research, spending weekends at inspection or catching flights or dropping ten to $20,000 on buyer's agents every single time. So if you're confused, lack confidence and just overwhelmed with all the information and marketing misinformation available online and don't know where to start, then this show is for you. So the obvious pro or the biggest factor that draws people in towards Airbnb is like, let's face it, the yields, the gross yields are like 10 to 15%, sometimes less, sometimes more. I know everything that I'll say is obviously a generalization. There's always exceptions to any rule. Every law is there to be broken. But in general, the yields are terrific. 10 to 15%. You contrast that with the average yield that residential property in Australia garners, it's about 3%, 3 to 3.5%. It's like, geez, it's not even any comparison. Of course, if you're buying top echelon, top five percentile yielding properties, residential long-term investments, you know, long-term rentals in Australia, like of course my clients buy and I have in my own portfolio, you're looking at more six to seven percent gross yield, but let's just compare it against five percent. Okay, the middle ground between what we achieve, six to seven percent, versus the Australian average three or four percent. Let's just go five percent for long-term average rental properties and then compare it to Airbnb, which is 10 to 15 percent, like that is three times almost, you know, like that's two to three times the amount of income that you're getting from, let's say, a five hundred thousand dollar investment. Like That's huge. It's hard to deny that there's something there. Like, couldn't that fast track our path to financial independence and financial happiness? It certainly could. And so I think this is a very important thing that all seasoned property investors or those that already have one or two under their belt, they always consider, okay, but also consider the downsides. But that was the first pro. And the second pro is the flexibility. When you have an Airbnb, you can decide to rent it out for six months of the year or like the peak season, maybe it's like school holidays or maybe it's the winter time if you're in a you know snowy location or maybe it's the Christmas time if you're in a tourist hot spot you can choose to rent it out through Airbnb and on those lull periods you can choose to go live there yourself right like you have that flexibility that of course if you have a long-term rental six month 12 month two year lease you know you can never live in that property now of course it's very important to separate investing versus pleasure but if you did for once, for some reason, wanted to combine it, then Airbnb allows you to do that. So those are the two pros, and I think everyone knows them, but the cons people don't know. And there's lots of people trying to sell you Airbnb, like, oh, this is the way advanced property investors get ahead. Let's just go systematically. I think there's about seven or eight cons. Number one is that a lot of banks actually won't look at Airbnb income for borrowing capacity. And if they do look at it, okay, if they do consider it, they need at least 12 to 24 months worth of rental statements, okay? And even if they do consider it, they shade the income that's there by 60 to 80 percent. What does all this mean? It's like a lot of terminologies that may go over your head. Basically, even though you're getting net income from renting out your property to Airbnb, banks don't like it. They don't like the unpredictability, the high-risk nature of Airbnb, and therefore, a lot of them will just say, hey, I know you've got 
debt against this property. I know you've got income. We're not just going to consider the income whatsoever. And so what that does is it limits your ability to get another property because all of a sudden you have, like, let's say, 500K of debt with no income. It's like, what? The bank's like, well, you know, you got to pay that off. We're not going <laughs> to lend you any more money. That is a huge deal. And even if they do consider the income, they're like, yep, okay, you've got 12 to 24 months of history. This is, you know, not some fly by the night type of Airbnb project. You're actually in it for the long haul. We're still going to set only take 20 to 40% of that income as contributing to your serviceability. So your income could be like $50,000. They may only take $10,000, $20,000. So that's going to severely limit your borrowing capacity versus a traditional long-term investment property, long-term rental. And therefore, your ability to scale a large portfolio is going to be greatly diminished. This is kind of the unsexy part of Airbnb that most people don't tell you, but it's incredibly important. The second con of Airbnb is that, you know, places like Ireland, other places like Manhattan in New York, they outlaw or at least put severe restrictions on Airbnb. You know, to be honest with you, I think the statistics are that in Australia, at least less than 2% of properties are Airbnb, but there's a lot of political innuendo and clout that goes with, hey, Airbnb is causing the homelessness and the housing shortage problem to be exacerbated. Therefore, there's a a lot of voter base that says do away with the NBAB. So that could actually happen in Australia. There could come a day where particular councils, particular states, particular cities may say, hey, we're not going to allow Airbnb at all. Or you're only allowed to rent out your Airbnb for six months of the year instead of 12 months. So all of a sudden, if you bought this like really expensive property with the intention of Airbnb being it, because it's very hard to quickly flip it over into a long term rental, maybe the yield will be terrible if you do so, then it actually just shot yourself in the foot. You've made a long-term decision and a short-term policy change has completely devastated your investment thesis and return. So that is a it's a likelihood, like let's not rule it out and that could mean a significant punishment to your return on investment. That's the second con. The third con is that of course there are additional fees with Airbnb compared to your traditional long-term rental. Okay, so you've got of course Airbnb fees itself, the platform fees, and then the insurance rates are huge and people go on about how Townsville has high insurance rates for traditional long-term rentals. Like take that and like blow it up even more with Airbnb because of course from a insurer's perspective it's a high risk property to insure with more tenants going in and out more can go wrong more wear and tear more opportunity for a bigger payout so they place a heftier premium which of course eats in to the bottom line. The fourth con of Airbnb versus a traditional investment is of course that initially you need to kit it out, you need to fit it out. You know, you, we love going on Airbnb and you know when you're on holiday, you're like, yeah, this house looks really good. It might not have been like the most fantastic house, but they furnished it really well, like with great taste and therefore you go for it. And that furnishing actually has cost the Airbnb owner, like, I don't know, $70,000, $100,000, $200,000 of course, based on the size and location and the demographics that they're trying to appeal to. And so then you're buying an Airbnb for let's say 500K, a million, you've got to add, you know, X amount, 50,000, 100,000, maybe more on just furniture. And therefore your return on investment is further diluted. Remember that furniture is going to depreciate and with higher amount of tenant attrition, you know, people staying two or three days going, to be honest, like I take care of Airbnbs when I go there, like, but I don't take care of them as if they were my own couch, my own dining table, my own TV set. Like I like to be ethical, but most people aren't as ethical, right? And therefore the wear and tear is more and therefore you have to replace that furniture. And that adds to the additional cost base on a yearly basis of owning an Airbnb property. So all of a sudden that 10 to 15% yield is getting eroded into eaten away by more and more metaphorical termites. The fifth con of Airbnb is that property management, you know, they can deal with a lot of the additional maintenance and work that comes with an Airbnb, but the property management fees 
are higher than your traditional long-term rental fees. So traditional long-term rental properties, let's say the property manager takes 7%, 8% on average across Australia. In Airbnb, you're looking more like 20%, okay, 20%. And even still, you need to be on top of that manager. The manager can let the ball slip. They can use tradies that are super expensive. Like let's say you've got a host and you've got a guest in an Airbnb and there's something wrong with the lighting. They send an electrician in and they don't get multiple quotes. They just go and emergency and it's like a $500 bill for changing a small little bulb that was out of reach for a tenant or for the guest and on an odd hour on a Sunday and they couldn't reach up to get there and it was a specialized thing that required a little bit of rewiring like you know if the property manager is not doing their job as efficiently as they can then the trades it really ends up being a premium versus the trades people that you would get for yourself so of course there's a property management fee but an additional fee for the let's say no one cares about your money as much as you do premium that the property manager will slap you you with because they're getting really expensive tradies in a lot of instances and let's be honest even with a property manager you can't outsource a hundred percent it's airbnb is never about set and forget it's always not a passive income strategy a lot of it's passive but it's always a headache let's say on your holiday and your airbnb back in australia something wrong with it your pm is trying to call you hey you know we can't reach our cleaner what should we do there's a new guest about to come in are you okay with us using this other cleaner they may not turn up on time they may not be of a good quality there's a lot of things that can go wrong so not only is property management expensive and further reaches into that 10 to 15 percent gross yield but it's not passive either and the sixth downside of Airbnb and there's many more is that the occupancy rate that we're trying to achieve is let's say around 70 percent okay of occupancy but that's really hard of course in many fantastic areas you can get 90 percent 100 percent occupancy but also in other areas it's like hard to even get 40 50 percent occupancy so there's a lot of data there's a lot of science that goes into picking where you should buy an airbnb house what you should be buying in that suburb and therefore how you should furnish it and how you should advertise so that occupancy rate is well above 70 percent and to get all of this right is not easy so there's a lot of work i would argue even more work getting that strategy and executing it perfectly versus a long-term rental and market shifts markets change and what you might find to be a good airbnb today may not be one in five years time and it's of course really expensive to buy and sell properties in australia so it's a really dynamic environment dynamic market for something that's actually a fixed static asset. So like I promised, the summary or the synopsis is would I ever go into an Airbnb property? Would I ever buy a property and do it for short-term rental? My personal answer is no. And the reason is that 10 to 15% attractive gross yield after everything that I've just mentioned goes down to around 7 to 10%. Okay, so seven to 10% is now closer to the types of yields that my clients and all solid property investors are getting anyway, six to seven percent. So why take on an additional headache and risk just to get an additional maybe two, three, four percent of rental yield? Yes, that's still objectively better, but you're putting more work into it. There's more downside risk and there's an inability to scale that portfolio because the banks won't lend to you as much as they will for long-term rental. And let's be honest, property investing is as much a finance and lending game as it is the selection of the right type of property. So if you only want one or two properties and you're willing to roll up your sleeves, you've got a lot of time, you don't necessarily work full time and you can manage this thing yourself, you don't need a property manager, you can buy a couple of Airbnb properties in your backyard, quote unquote, so to speak, and you can manage it yourself, saving yourself that 20% PM cost and you have like an immense obsession with customer service, then I I think this strategy of Airbnb short-term rental is for you. You can get, you know, net around 10% yield. But if you can't do that, if you need this to be passive, if you don't want additional headache, you want to scale a portfolio, you know, four, five, six, seven properties and make your ultimate income truly passive, 
and you want to diversify your portfolio across Australia to hedge your bets, lower your risk, then I don't think Airbnb is for you. Now, there's always exceptions to what I've said. This is a generalization, but you really need to be in the top 1% of Airbnb investors to do better than what I've just described. And the vast majority will actually even do worse than what I've just described in terms of the numbers. So take it for what it is. Let me know your experience and thoughts. If you want to level up and really take property investing by the collar and just demolish it to finance a lifestyle for yourself and your family, then level up. The most important real estate is not long-term rentals, is not short-term rentals, but the six inches between your two ears. I'll leave links below to my Facebook group with more than 30,000 people, Australian Property Mastery with PK, in the comments below and engage yourself in that content. It's completely free and I'll see you in the next episode. My name's PK, catch you later, bye.